Let's take a moment, and uh, as we do every week, you pray that I would teach you the truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll pray you'll be receptive to it. I was reminded uh, this very morning when I woke up and looked at my clock on, by my bedside, and it gave me the time. And I was, I, I, I thought I had gone off in a power surge, but there it was, it was on, and it told me the time. And so I took my time until later. I looked at my watch, and it was 20 minutes later than my clock at the bed said. And I thought about it, and, and here was my discovery. Had it been a day off or six hours off, I would have never believed it. If it, instead of saying 7 o'clock, it said 12 o'clock, I wouldn't have thought a thing about it. Actually, when I looked at it really, really close, it said p.m. and not a.m., so that, would have, that should have been a clue. But, but here is the lesson I learned even this morning in that, and that is sometimes the most dangerous statement truths are ones that are just almost true. If, it's, if, if somebody comes to you and teaches you a big, blatant untruth, you can spot that. Uh, it goes back to last week when we talked about Satan added a word, not. One word changed everything. And so when I ask you to pray for me, it's, it's really built on this sense of uh, how easy three degrees or 20 minutes can make it look like the truth when in fact it isn't. So the prayers are sincere. And uh, so let's do that for each other. Father, we come and we ask that the truth would be taught and that it would free us, free us from our guilt, our shame, our past, our fears, our ego, our self-righteousness. Free us, Father, with the truth that we could be transformed from the inside out. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. As you know, we're going through this study of 1 Thessalonians. I love this book. Um, there is so much richness in this book. And so we're, two weeks ago, we looked at the scriptures Last week we looked at Satan, and this week we're going to look at suffering, all just laid out here. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, says this, that no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come about and just as you know. And for this reason, I could bear it no longer. I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions... For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction as it has come to pass and just as you know. One of the amazing truths for me is how seldom Christians think that suffering is going to be a part of their life. No matter how many 
times it's taught, no matter how many verses that are in the scriptures, there's something about us as human beings, as Christians, who the first glimpse of suffering, affliction, pressure, uh, we, we tend to crumble. We, we, we are somewhat surprised by it. it. And it's not new to us. It's new to these Thessalonians. Paul said, I told you you were going to be in affliction. Peter tells us, don't be surprised by the fiery ordeal that you're in. Suffering is a part of life, and it is a part of our faith journey. And to the degree that we understand it probably will impact our faith as much as anything. If you don't think you should suffer, if you don't think there should be bad consequences, if you don't think there should be affliction, if you don't think you should lose your job, if you don't think you should get cancer, if you don't think you should be betrayed, and then you will be surprised by those things. That's, that's what Paul's saying. And when you're surprised by it, you're shook, you become unstable in your faith. And, and many Christians are. But suffering's been a part of our lives forever. In fact, some believe that Job was the first book in the Bible to be written, and it dealt with suffering. The whole book is about trying to deal with one topic, suffering. And yet, again, we tend to be surprised. Tim Keller, in his book, Walking with God through pain and suffering. Look at all those little notes. That's how good this book is. But he says on page three this. Therefore, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well we have put together a good life, no matter how hard we have worked to be healthy and wealthy and comfortable with friends and family and successful with our career, something will inevitably ruin it. No amount of money, power, planning can prevent dire illness, relationship betrayal, financial disaster, and a host of other troubles from entering our lives. Human life is fragile and, the, and subject to forces beyond our power to manage. Life is tragic. Scott Peck says this in his book, The Road Less Travel, life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see it, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult because once we have accepted it, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Western culture, American culture, American Christianity is the worst at preparing people for suffering. We're tragic. Our Gospels are about affluence and comfort and ease. And, and many Christians abandon the faith because nobody warned them of the sufferings that was to come. I'm thrown by sufferings. When things don't work out perfectly, it throws me a curve. And, and so in this deep truth uh, in 1 Thessalonians, there's this, there's this preparation for struggle. When I was speaking in Bangladesh one year, I met an amazing couple, young couple, 20, 24 and 23 Christians, missionaries in a singing group traveling throughout Bangladesh with the gospel of Jesus Christ, fell in love with them. A year later, I come back to Bangladesh and I discover she's died. In one of their missionary journeys, she caught an illness and she died. And when I went to, went to her husband, this young man who I loved, I didn't quite know what to say to him. I didn't know, what do you say to a 24-year-old young man who's in love with somebody that's passed away? And he looked at me and he said to me in very simple terms, it is God's will, Bill. It is God's will. Thank you. 
You just wanted to get on the screen, Daniel. <laughs> what Daniel will do to get seen is, thank you so much, my brother. I'm going to knock that off. And, and I thought, you know, when you grow up in Bangladesh and you don't have hospitals like we have hospitals and air conditioners and, the, and, and floods come and your houses wash down streams and your spouses die, you, you become much more aware of the dependency upon God. It is a part of life. It's, you can't, as Keller says, you can't separate yourself from it. Now, the beautiful thing about Christianity, if, if you don't know it, is how different it is from all the other world religions and philosophy when it comes to suffering. So let me describe the difference. Unlike fatalism, fatalism is this belief that suffering is going to come and, the problem, and, the, and what you have to do is bear up, don't complain, grit your teeth, and just endure. Christianity comes along and says you can express your pain. You can cry over your brother's death. You can cry aloud on the cross. That unlike fatalism, Christianity says we can weep in our suffering. Unlike Buddhism, Christianity teaches us that suffering is real. It's not an illusion. It's not a lower state of thinking. It is very real. I love that about Christianity. It embraces the reality of suffering. Unlike karma, which teaches you you get what you give in direct proportion to who you are, Christianity comes along and says, no, suffering is unfair. It is disproportionate. It does not all hit us equally based on our sinfulness. Some of us are dealt terrible cards. Some children are, are, are given diseases well before their age. It is unfair, and it is disproportionate, and Christianity accepts that reality. And unlike secularism, which sees suffering as an interruption to a comfortable life, secular, secularism sees suffering as an interruption to a comfortable life. Now, take a moment there and say, wait, wait, well, that sounds like Christianity. And if it is, it isn't Christianity. It's secularism. Secularism says that pain and suffering is an interruption to a comfortable life. Christianity comes along and says, no, it's very meaningful. It's very purposeful. It has meaning and purpose in it. I mean, think about this. You may not, you may not discover this, that, that, that at the heart of Christianity, at its very core, at the central of it is suffering. Jesus suffered on a cross. 1 Peter 2. At the central point of your belief in Christianity is that at the center point of your faith is suffering. And so I say that to say we ought not to be surprised when we suffer. And yet we are. I say this to say, now I'm not speaking from the scripture, but, I, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I think that over the coming years, maybe decades, Christians will suffer much more significantly in our country than they have in the past. I'm going to suggest to you, given the virus or future virus or economy or depression or inflation or hazardness or unemployment, I would say do not be surprised if you find in the coming years that there is much more suffering than affluence in you. And so like Paul to the Thessalonians, I would say to those at Table Rock Fellowship, I warn you that suffering may become more normative in our lives. And so this teaching today becomes even more significant if I'm right. So here's the truth I want to teach, real simple. The truth is this. You will suffer, but it has purpose. Let me say it again. You will suffer, but it 
has purpose. If you get that, if, if you understand that you will suffer, which means you're not going to be surprised, but it has purpose and meaning, then it changes the whole equation. Now, why do I say that? Again, we ought not to be surprised by this. Jesus, in John 19, suffers on the cross. Jesus, in John 16, says, you are going to suffer. That's, that, those are the words of Jesus. You're going to suffer. You're going to be in affliction. You will experience things. I'm warning you now, you will suffer. Paul told the Thessalonians they were going to suffer. Peter told uh, in his letters they were going to suffer. James says in his letter, at the beginning of his letter, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. This book, if it is about anything, is to help us to be aware that the first truth is we are going to suffer and therefore ought not to be surprised. But here's the second part of the statement, which is what we're going to study this morning and next week. But the suffering that you are experiencing has meaning and purpose. Victor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, says the most painful suffering is the, the suffering that is unmeaningful. If I find myself in a midst of sufferings, of afflictions, of pain, and there is no meaning to it, despair comes. Suffering comes out of the hardship of it. Victor Frankl says in his book that man can live with any what if he knows the why. If you understand why, if you understand the purpose and the meaning behind it, it makes the suffering less painful. So this morning I'm going to teach you four truths and I'm going to take you to four verses that you probably have never looked at regarding suffering. So let's go. First truth of the why, the purpose, the possible reason for the suffering is in 2 Corinthians. Go there. Get your Bibles. Open them up and find 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Because one of the whys, and this is not a priority list, this is just one of the possible reasons for the suffering and the affliction and the pains that you're in, no matter how slight or how tragic they are, is this, that suffering increases ministry. If you want your life to have ministry, if you want your ministry to expand, it will expand because of suffering. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Who, now let's go back to verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, verse 4, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What, what's Paul saying? Paul's saying that the very, the very sufferings, pain that I'm experiencing allows me to comfort those who need comforting. I mean, the worst person to go to for help is a person who has not experienced your suffering. If you've been a divorce, you seek someone who's been to divorce. If you have cancer, you seek someone who has cancer. If, if you've lost a child, you seek someone who's lost a child. If you lost a spouse, you seek somebody who lost a spouse because you know they feel your pain. That, that's what Paul says. Paul says that the God who comforts us in our affliction so that we can turn that into comforting on others. This, this affliction, this suffering that you may be going through could in fact open you up to amazing ministry that you will never have without the suffering. Henry now 
Now one says this, no one escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not how we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed. The question is how we can put our woundedness into service to others. When our wounds cease to be the source of shame and become the source of healing, we become wounded healers which is what Jesus was on the cross. It is by his wounds we found healing. A woman who loses a child is always sought out by other women who have lost their child. Because there's something in the eyes of someone who has suffered that allows us to release our brokenness and our shame and our guilt and our tears. And when you allow God to comfort you, you will have the capacity to comfort others. And in your woundedness, in your sorrow, in your pain, your eyes will reflect grace and mercy. And so in one sense, I welcome the suffering because God will expand a ministry beyond what I ever imagined. There's so much in Scripture. Joseph, we, we, we know, his brothers were envious. He's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. He goes to a house, is accused of a wrong crime, sent to prison, endures the prison, escapes the prison. And all of that is a sequence of sufferings. All of it. You go to prison for seven years for something you didn't do and find where God is in that story. And he goes through all of that, but the verse that I have gotten wrong most of my life is in Genesis 50, 20. Because I've always said, as, as for you, you meant it for, against me, but God meant it for my good. That's how I've always read it, but that's sloppy reading. Because Genesis 50, 20 says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many should be kept alive as they are today. What, what happened there? Because of the journey of this indifference, affliction caused on him by his brothers, Joseph reached a level where he allowed Egypt to prepare for the famines that were to come, and because of that preparation and his leadership, people who would have died didn't die. His suffering was a ministry to people who would live. Rick Warren says this about woundedness. Express your woundedness. Other people are going to find healing in your wounds. Your greatest life messages and your most effective ministry will come out of your deepest hurts. He goes on to say, I sit at tables with ministers all the time and they're talking about how big their churches are and how many people come and how many people love them and all about their new facility. And they sit there and they outdo each other until one of them says, as a pastor to the group, my wife just left me and I don't know how to tell my congregation. And then the, con and then the conversation turns and another guy at the table says, I got an elder who hates me. Your suffering can be an amazing avenue of ministry you will never have in your life if you don't embrace it and love, allow God to comfort you. And many of you have no ministry in anybody's life because your eyes reflect no tears, no sadness, no pain. And Paul says, I come clean. Let me take you to a second reason, purpose, meaning, and suffering. It, it produces humility. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul is talking about the thorns in his flesh. I personally believe that Paul had bad eyesight. That was his his thorn in the flesh. And the reason I think, say it is that some of the closing letters, he says, look at how large the letters I am writing to you. And so I can't imagine anything harder for a missionary who has poor sight. And I think Paul was constantly saying to God, let me see that when I travel, I won't be dependent upon those around me to guide me. 
it's a painful story. Don't know what it is. I'm going to guess that, but it's something that was tragic for him. So in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says this, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surprising greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave. But he said to me, now follow this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Ah, oh, if only we could get that. If only we could begin to discover that we can tell the truth of our story. We don't have to hide. We don't have to prop God up. We don't have to claim miracles that didn't happen. We can tell people prayers go unanswered. Because what Paul is saying is in my weakness, his strength was seen. Really, in my humility, in my lack of becoming conceited because of all the revelations I was giving to people. We avoid pain. We avoid it and do everything conceivable to do it, including disobedience and addictions of every sort. Addiction is the pathway away from legitimate suffering, meaning there is suffering that's going to come into your life that has nothing to do with you. Something that happens in your family that had nothing to do with you. It's a legitimate, necessary suffering. It wasn't caused by your sin. It wasn't caused by your action. It happened. Your, your spouse goes out and gets in a head-on collision by somebody else and they die. It had nothing to do with you. It therefore becomes a legitimate, necessary suffering. And Paul says the escape of that is not addiction. The escape of that is to um, embrace my humility, to tell the truth. My ego will do everything it can to prop up my self, false self. Most of us spend our lives creating a false self, a fake self. That's what we do for the first 50 years of our life. That's what I did for the first 50 years of my life. You build a career. You want to look good. You want to be successful. You want to be wealthy. You want to be powerful. We do everything we can to get admiration and love and respect, and people seek us out first. They call us for the party first. We do all that we can to build this fake self, this false self. And then suffering comes along and begins to dismantle us. And it's the greatest gift you can get, get when you begin to release and stop hiding. Every one of us in this room, everyone in, in the place that you're sitting has experienced suffering, will experience suffering, are experiencing suffering, and it becomes something that produces with us, in us a humility that rocks us to our soul because we will do everything we can to protect our false self. And what Paul says is that the greatest obstacle to ministry is pride, is self, is that fake self. I sat with very dear friends last week and we uncovered what God was doing to strip us of our false self. One of the ladies in the conversation is 64, grew up in an incredibly great family, loves family and has been single her whole life. And it is what breeds humility into her because she would love to be married. Another guy that was a great athlete now finds himself with MS and it's stripping him of everything that allowed him to be respected. For me, it's a son broken. Cobbler's son has no shoes. And God has a way in our suffering to strip us down so he can use us. Your greatest ministry, trust me, your greatest ministry is not going to come out of your success. 
Your greatest ministry is going to come out of your humility. And the path to humility is not another Bible study. The path to humility is normally through the valley of humiliation. And, and here is this great preacher who reveals revelation and he can't even, let's just say, see, or at least his prayers are not getting answered because he asked three times. And God's response to him is, I will be made perfect in your weakness. So come clean, church. Start telling your story. Accept the brokenness. Find your foundation because the antidote to skepticism is authenticity. And Paul allowed himself in his suffering to become authentic. Third truth about suffering is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17 and 18. Go there. So why does God allow suffering in our lives? One, it expands our ministry. It allows us to comfort those who need comforting. It makes us someone who people approach in their suffering. The second reason is it drives us to humility, to dismantle the false self, to, become, to come into this fellowship and come into any group with your hands open and transparent in who you are and no longer afraid that somebody's going to find out the truth. And the third truth here is found in verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transparent, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Suffering redirects our attention to heaven. It makes us hope. Human beings have a hope shapeness in them. Our life, now follow this, our lives are shaped today by our hope in tomorrow. We live today in light of what we believe about tomorrow. And the greater our hope, the greater our faithfulness today. True story of two men who were thrown into prison. And when they were going into prison, one of the men discovered that his wife and daughter had died in the war. And the other man discovered that his wife and daughter were waiting for him. And both men went into the same prison. And in the first two years, the first man whose wife was dead and daughter was dead died. And the second man who believed and knew that his wife was alive, survived 10 years, and left that prison strong and free. Why? Same prison. The difference is one had hope and the other one didn't. I mean, if, if, if your hope is based on that fact that God is going to make your life comfortable and easy, then you have a false hope. If, 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 you, um, if your hope is that everything falls great for you, you have a false hope. The early Christians suffered with great poise and peace because of their hope. Hope that Jesus was returning. That's what he does in 1 Thessalonians in every chapter. He says he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. He is, he is our hope. 1 Peter says we have a living hope. The early Christians who understood the scriptures in the Colosseums, history tells us, when the lions were tearing them apart, continued to sing hymns and were heard forgiving those who had released the lions because of their hope. Their hope was that it would be that strong. C.S. Lewis talks about the great divorce 
And when he talks about heaven, he says this, that once we attain, once we get to heaven, we will discover that life will work backward and turn even agony into glory that somehow in heaven we will see the beauty of all that's gone on in, in, in a way that we've never seen it. We, we will understand the fullness of the story, and in that our agony will, will become glory. Tolkien, the great writer, Christian writer, says that there will come a time when everything sad is going to come untrue. Why? Because of our hope. Because what is real, what is true. We're going to pick up on this next week. Um, but let me just say this. Um, there are two roads that you can go down when it comes to suffering and pain. One road is to get better. One road is to get bitter. One road is to get softer. One road is to get harder. One road is to grow deeper. And one road is to quit. One road is to complain. And one road is to rejoice. One road is to be surprised. And another road is to be prepared. So it is interesting to me that we have decided to start communion again, which I love, here and at home with you, because communion reminds us of the sufferings of Jesus. So if you think faith comes cheap, as Bonhoeffer told us, it's not cheap, but it is free that there is suffering in our lives and it's reflected in this moment of communion. So we're going to pass out the elements here. And if you're at home, I want you to take the element and hold on to a moment and reflect on the suffering of Jesus and how his suffering brought healing to you. How his suffering expanded his ministry so that he learned through his suffering how to comfort us in our own. That's Hebrews. That there's a certain humility that came in Jesus on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is a certain sense of glory that Jesus experienced when he realized that he and the one next to him, the criminal, through grace, would be uh, free to go. So we're going to take communion. Thanks, Mike. If you forgot it, it's okay. We'll do it next week. Um, but... Scripture tells us that the church would gather and they would celebrate because it reminded them of Christ's suffering and their suffering and the purpose in it. Because out of Christ's suffering comes our forgiveness. Out of his suffering, he exchanges his righteousness for our righteousness. And so they would take a, a, a loaf, a wafer, unleavened bread, and they would break it, and they would say, this is Christ's body, take, eat, in remembrance of me. And they would take the cup, the sufferings of Jesus, the passion of the Christ, the heart of Christianity. And they would take it and say, this represents Christ's blood which was shed for us. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Let me pray. Father, I pray 
for anyone in this fellowship who this very day is in pain and suffering, whether it be emotional or physical or mental. Friends, betrayal, loss of a job, diagnosis that comes back, cancer, I pray that they and the rest of us would embrace it and know that in the comforting that we will experience with you that we can comfort those who they themselves have lost dear ones, who find themselves with an illness, who have lost their job. May we be a, a church of compassion, Father. May that be said of us. May we May we demonstrate compassion and grace. May it come, flow out of us. May people seek us because our eyes, they're soft. Father, in the pain and the suffering we endure, may we find a humility. May we embrace it. May we allow you to strip us down from our fake, false self to become a genuine true self. May we allow you to shape us into Jesus. May you take away our pride and our ego and our self-absorbedness and our selfishness and our greed. Strip us from the things that get in the way and may our humility, may our authenticity, may our genuineness, may we tell the truth no matter how bad it makes us look, and maybe even you, may we tell the truth. May we live the truth. May we find when we're living the truth, uh, grace. And may we, may we be assured that in that revealing of our brokenness, we have free somebody to tell us of their brokenness. And dear Father, in the midst of this, may we look to that which is unseen. May we not be consumed by that which our eyes see, for it, is, it will dissipate. May we treasure, may suffering remind us that we have a living hope. May we, as the early church, sing in the Colosseums when we're dying, not complaining, not giving up, not quitting, not hiding, not blaming you, that we will sing to your glory. And so, Father, I pray if there's a believer in our fellowship that does not know that they will suffer, awaken them so they are not surprised. And if they don't know why, may these three and next week's teachings from the Scriptures teach them why. Because when we have that why, when we seek you intimately involved in our lives, when we see you shaping us, when we see you making us like Jesus, and we say we want to be like Jesus... When, when we see you shape us into Jesus because of the sufferings, may we celebrate it. May that be what produces our joy. And so we bring you us. We pray for each other. May you be glorified in all things. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. A half hour from now, 1045-ish, we will have a half hour discussion on suffering. Enjoy your day. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, may it be blessed. May you live well and experience the fullness of joy of the Holy Spirit.